Welcome, everyone, to another episode of You and the Law presented by the Chicago Bar Association. Today, we have two guests, Josh Singlewald and Jennifer Lavin, who are family law practitioners in Cook County. Um, Josh, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josh Singlewald from Singlewald Law Firm. Uh, my firm is a divorce law firm uh, located in Chicago, and we handle cases uh, in Cook County, Lake County, DuPage County, and some other counties as well with uh, the ability of Zoom. But we primarily focus on divorce and parentage actions, uh, which includes child support, property division, as well as premarital agreements uh, and orders of protection. And for today's purposes, uh, uh, I believe I'll be uh, expounding on uh, custody disputes. And Dr. Jennifer Lavin, could you tell us a little bit about your practice? Sure. So I am a solo practitioner. I have a staff of a legal, legal assistant and two law clerks who help me. But my practice these days is primarily that of a child representative guardian ad litem in Cook County. And we'll get more into that, I know, as we're talking today. But I'm also a mediator. I do parenting coordination and collaborative law. Fewer and farther between these days is contested litigation that I take on as my own client, because really right now I'm too busy advocating for kids to be taking on a lot of contested uh, custody matters. But we'll talk more about all of that as we go together today. Too busy can often be a, a good problem to have. <laughs> so, Josh, I would like you to tell me what it is in Illinois to obtain custody. Sure. So when someone comes to me initially, the first uh, question I have is, is this a divorce action or is this a parentage slash paternity action? And what that means is if it's a divorce action and there are children involved, uh, it's presumed under the law that the children of the marriage are children or the children are children of the marriage. If the parties are not married and they have children, which we would call a paternity case or a parentage case, then we need to determine, okay, who uh, whose children are they? And I think what you're getting at, Asim, is we would look at it in, in one of a few different ways. As I said, in, in a divorce situation, the presumption under marriage is that the parties, uh, the children are, are of the marriage. Uh, but in a paternity case where uh, folks are not married and they have children, we look at was at the time of the birth, was the whose name is on the birth certificate, as well as, and more importantly, uh, was a VAP, otherwise known as a voluntarily voluntary acknowledgement of paternity, was that signed? And the VAP is a very important and very powerful document because if that was signed, uh, typically in this case, in, in cases by the father, uh, it is going to be very challenging for that father in the future uh, to claim that the child uh, is not his. Uh, so that's one, that's the second way in terms of determining uh, our, our children of, of the parties. And then third and finally, uh, if there was not a VAP, uh, Voluntary Acknowledgement of Paternity uh, signed, uh, potentially we would petition the court for a DNA test and ultimately have the court adjudicate whether uh, or not uh, a parent or parents um, are associated with that child. And uh, Dr. Lavin, could you explain what when you come into the fold when a custody or paternity case is initiated? Sure. So in Cook County and all of our counties, actually, in Illinois, you have to go to mediation as it relates to child related matters regarding parenting time and decision making. And if you reach a complete agreement there, then you don't go to the level of a child representative or a guardian ad litem being appointed because you've reached a complete agreement, which is great. But when I come into the picture and people who do this work are appointed by the court, we come into the picture when there is not a complete agreement among the parties, whether it be two unmarried parents or two married parents. And ultimately, that means regarding issues of parenting time and decision making regarding the children. And that decision making has really four major issue areas. It's healthcare, education, religion, if you have a faith based preference, and also extracurricular activities. So if it's either or and or both, 
of those two issues, parenting time and decision making, if there's not a complete agreement on one or bo- on one or both of those issues, then that's when a child representative or a guardian ad litem is going to be appointed by the court because the parents don't have an agreement. And that person is appointed to come in, do an investigation and make recommendations as a guardian ad litem and have positions on behalf of the children as a child representative regarding what is in the best interests of the children to resolve the disputes. And so I know you've heard myself and Josh refer to uh, these disputes as custody disputes. Is there a difference in a custody dispute in Illinois and, as you had just explained, an allocation of parenting time or decision making? Yes. And so it's it's terminology in a lot of ways, but our statute is really it's unique in terms of what we do here in Illinois versus what other uh, other certainly other states do in terms of family law descriptions of these things. We used to have the terminology custody and several years ago that went by the wayside and the legislature has changed the focus of our language, but it's more than semantics, I think, to call it allocation of parenting time, allocation of decision-making. Ultimately, those two things are within the, the umbrella of allocation of parental responsibilities and parenting time. And I think if I'm you know, going off on a limb here to a little bit of my own interpretation of what that statutory change was based upon. I think it's because we have two parents. We have both parents who are responsible for children. It's not one parent who has, quote, custody and the other one does not. We have decision making that even when it's not both parents per se, uh, they're still usually input by the other parent, even in a, quote, sole decision making situation. Both parents have parenting time. So I think a lot of this was born of the fact that we have two parents who want to facilitate both parents in terms of rights and responsibilities, in terms of parenting time and decision making, so that we're not in this situation where the kids are essentially tug of war ropes, where one parent thinks they have all of it and the other parent doesn't, in terms of decision-making and or parenting time, because it really is a mutual endeavor. It seems as though the change in language probably cut through a lot of uh, arguments regarding the the word custody, if you will. Right. I think a lot of people used to get really stuck because they wanted custody. I want full custody. I want sole custody. Well, that doesn't mean that the other parent doesn't have rights. And it doesn't mean that the other parent doesn't have parenting time. That's always been true. I think the nomenclature, the language has caught up to the sentiment in terms of of what the law has actually done, we have better terminology now. Josh, I see that you're nodding to uh, Dr. Lavin's points. Um, as a representative of the parties, the parents, or the, the do- soon-to-be divorcees, has this change in nomenclature had an effect on how you uh, how you handle your clients? I don't know if it necessarily has an effect, but certainly for educational purposes, as, as Jennifer was saying, you know, majority of my clients say exactly what Jennifer just said. I want, you know, I want custody. I want this. The fact of the matter is uh, majority of my clients and majority of folks going through this didn't understand exactly what custody meant back in the day. Um, oftentimes, they always thought custody meant what was actually visitation and now called uh, 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 visitation is now called parenting time, which is just more of a proper term, but it's also more of a descriptive term uh, in terms of your your parenting time with your children, where custody was always decision making, but nobody ever understood that. No one ever understood that really custody was dealing with the four prongs and elements that Jennifer just mentioned in terms of education, healthcare, extracurricular activities um and religion um so it it's done a it's done a a proper service uh to uh attorneys as well as clients of understanding the process more and just being a little more basic now that being said we still oftentimes with our clients at least you know re- mention custody or mention visitation i try to pull away from that and and talk in the uh, verbiage of the statute now, because again, I think it's uh, self-explanatory in terms of um, parenting time and decision making. That kind of, to me, it resonates, and I think it resonates with my clients. So, if anything, Asim, it, it's just educating my clients on the new terminology, saying that, um, and providing them with the the advice that things necessarily haven't changed overall, um, but uh, you know, very seldom do you see a sole 
custody case back in the day, much like now, very seldom do you see a sole decision-making case uh, or a sole parenting time case. Um, so I just explained that to them, but let them know that the process uh, continues to be ideally fair uh, and, and not necessarily one-sided and not pro-mom or pro-dad. It's really pro-family. And with with children being at the center, and as Jennifer mentioned, the best interests of the child, that's ultimately what everyone wants to uh, protect, um, whether I'm representing mom or dad. And so uh, along those lines, uh, and I, I think I've heard Dr. Lavin state that she's appointed by the court when there isn't an agreement as to the allocation of decision-making authority or parenting time, she is appointed to help the court uh, make those decisions. Why then would a mom or a dad need you to uh, represent them if if the court already has Dr. Lavin? Sure. So when the court appoints uh, Jennifer as either a guardian ad litem or a child representative, uh, she's being appointed truly to be the eyes and ears of the court for the benefit of the children. Um, so what I would say to a client is one, you know, we want to be obviously very respectful uh, to Miss Lavin. We want to provide her with our utmost attention and cooperation because Miss Lavin is going to be performing uh, interviews nowadays, still typically via Zoom, although sometimes those are house visits, not only with the parents, but also with the children. And even if the children are of tender age. Uh, I know Jennifer will will watch them uh, interact with the parents uh, on an iPad or, or what have you um, and build a, a bit of a relationship with the children. But ultimately, Jennifer is charged with protecting the best interests of the children and being the eyes and ears of the court, where for me, my job is to protect my client. So whether that's dad or mom, and you know, we've talked about some of the intricacies of the statutes and just the verbiage alone, but my job is to walk my client through the process to try to educate them uh, on the process and put us in a position and a strategic position of how are we going to communicate with Ms. Lavin about what are our goals, not necessarily just for the children, but also for the parent and some parents, you know, don't understand that if they don't have a quote unquote regular nine to five job, but maybe they work nights, maybe they work nine o'clock to seven in the morning. That's going to be a much difficult situation uh, when we're talking about allocating parenting time. And that's where Jennifer could use her insights uh, into, you know, what a potential schedule maybe would look like or what have you. But uh, a sim to ultimately answer your question, just because there's a guardian ad litem appointed, I do believe, and I'm of the belief that both parents should have counsel uh, for the advice and legal advice that we're able to provide our clients and in, in helping them through the process. And Dr. Lavin, is there a difference in what a guardian ad litem is or GAL and a child rep? Yes. So I don't want to get too in the, the weeds on this per se, but there are some important differences. I'll highlight a couple because there are several, but I think one of the main ones is in terms of the the lack of confidentiality is across the board with a guardian ad litem, for example. So when I'm appointed as a guardian ad litem, I have no attorney client privilege. I have no confidentiality with anyone, whether that's the children that I'm involved in working with, their parents, any collaterals, anyone I talk to, every single thing in my file is discoverable. So the attorneys in the case could send a subpoena to me and ask me to produce correspondence, communications, and my notes and things like that that have been relayed back and forth as, as my investigation has gone forward. So that's one thing. But as a child representative, there is confidentiality with the children that I work with. So that's an important difference. There's no confidentiality with the attorneys, the parents, the collaterals, but there is that confidentiality with children. But I think it's still important as a child representative to note 
that I still have to talk to adults in terms of the court and counsel. So as much as I try to protect that confidentiality, there are still going to be things that I do need to talk about in terms of the children, in terms of their welfare, in terms of their best interests, how my investigation has formed the positions that I'm taking as a child representative to advocate for the children and whatnot. So I, I talk to kids about the fact that, look, this is not a complete bar on me having communication with people. It's just that I'm going to try really hard to protect what you've said to me, but I still have to talk about some things in court sometimes with the adults. Interesting. And and whether, whether you take a position uh, that is favorable to mom or dad or, or one of the moms or one of the dads, what is that position based on? Well, I think these are similar things. And, and, you know, in child representative world, I would take a position and I would not testify in court. But as a guardian ad litem, I could potentially write a report. I would testify in court potentially at a hearing or a trial. And the things that I have to say in terms of recommendations, positions, what have you, are born of my investigation. So the people that I'm talking to are really critical to this process, certainly the children. Uh, the fact that I have spoken to the children usually at least once and maybe more than once by the time we get to a hearing or trial is certainly derivative of what a lot of my recommendations and positions are based upon, because those are the people who are actually in the mix here that we are advocating for. So it's not to say that kids have a choice about what it is that I'm going to do, uh, but they have a voice. And certainly the older the child, the more that that voice is something that is is articulate to me that ultimately working with a teenager is a different experience than working with a toddler, right? They're not going to be able to vocalize in the same way with me. It's not to say that I don't care any less, right? It's I do very much, but at the same time, the children's communications improve with me. So they can literally tell me more about what they would perhaps like to see happen. Not that they have the vote, but at the same time, if they had to weigh in and tell me how things are going and what they would like to see, they can usually do that as they get older a little bit better. And then in terms of parents, in terms of collaterals, when I say collaterals, who are those people? These could be spouses, new significant others that are involved in the case. I want to talk to those people. I always want to talk to a therapist. If the kids are having therapy, I want to find out how they're doing in therapy. I sometimes, but not always, talk to teachers because if a child's doing well in school, I don't need to have to have a conversation per se. But if kids are struggling, if they have special needs issues, I'm going to want to talk to the teacher to figure out how we can serve them best in terms of recommendations going forward. And then in terms of also other collaterals, that may also be people who are medical doctors, maybe. If the kids have significant medical issues, that may be a reason for me to need to talk to a medical professional as well. And so all of my recommendations, all the positions are in many ways in an aggregate form based upon all the people I've talked to. And I consider what's in the kid's best interest based upon a lot of different people I'm hearing from during the pendency of the investigation itself. Don't have a choice, but they have a voice. I, I might have to steal that tagline from right. You have a voice, but you don't have a choice. I say it a lot. And I say it in age appropriate ways as kids get older and feel free to take it. I, I stole it too. <laughs> So what, I heard you talk about the collaterals and, and as part of your investigation. How important, if at all, is it that you have a good relationship with parents? Ultimately, I think the parents have a lot to say in terms of what's going to happen and for their kids, and they often have a very vested interest in that result. And I understand that. Um, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, though, that parents have their opinions and they have their positions, and they're usually at least some to a maybe high degree of polarized in terms of what they would like to see, because inherent to my appointment is that they don't agree on everything. And so parent A wants X in terms of parenting time, parent B wants X in terms of parenting time. They may be completely parallel and far apart. My role is to try to figure out a way to bridge the gap that's in the kid's best interests. And same for decision making. Maybe one parent feels like they've been more active in certain areas of decision making than the other parent. So they want to have more weight to their own opinions in that process. Now, I will say that I can't make everybody happy because ultimately the result of my appointment is that I'm going to disappoint people. I, I say that to both parents at least once. I'm not here for you. I'm not here for the other parent. I'm here for the kids. 
And ultimately, I'm going to disappoint one or both of you as we go along because you're not always going to get everything that you want. But my role is to hopefully come down a middle path and find a way to advocate for what's in the children's best interest. It may not be what either parent wants per se, but we need to craft a schedule. We need to figure out a way to move forward on decision making that's going to work in the best possible way for your kids. And that's who I'm here for. So I say that all the time. Look, I'm not here to be a cheerleader for either one of you. And it's not about a popular contest because I will tell you that sometimes parents don't like what I have to say, but I hope that it's with a spirit of this is why I'm making these recommendations. It usually helps it at least to be more palatable. So Josh, I'm sure, you know, um, I'm sure you've run into instances where your client feels that the child rep or the guardian ad litem does not like them. Um, how do you handle a situation where your, your client isn't the, the, most favorite person of the child rep or the guardian ad litem. Sure. So I, I appreciate everything that Jennifer uh, just said, and I, I truly um, uh, agree agree with what she just said. And and to your point, Asim, yes, oftentimes whether it's my client or the other client, uh, you can imagine maybe they don't like uh, the GAL or child rep, and and maybe that's because of the recommendations uh, that uh, he or she is making. Uh, but here is one thing that I do say uh, to all my clients when a GAL or a guardian at, excuse me, a GAL or a child rep is appointed. You must remember a judge has appointed this GAL or child representative. And in Cook County and outlying counties, the list of GALs and child representatives, that list contains very highly respected attorneys who have taken additional classes, received additional certifications, additional education to obtain the status of being a guardian ad litem or a child representative. Not just every attorney gets on that list. And once you are on that list, uh, generally speaking, uh, known or unknown, judges probably have their, you know, I'll say their favorites or their, not necessarily favorites, but their go-tos. They understand that maybe Jennifer Lavin is great at handling a particular type of family. Maybe someone else is, is better off with, with a different type of uh, issue at hand. So I tell my clients, it, it's not necessarily my decision of whether we don't like, and you know, in this hypothetical, whether we don't like Jennifer Lavin or not, but the issue is a judge has appointed her for her expertise, for her skill, for her knowledge, for her ability to cut through the entanglements that we're dealing with and the reason why these parties uh, are in or, or have not been successful in mediation and are in need of a child rep or a guardian ad litem. Um, so I, I guess to expound on that, Asim, I would say this. I generally will tell a client, uh, we are, you know, we're, we're certainly not seeking a change of a guardian ad litem or child representative. And, and part of that is, is maybe a little bit selfish, but I all think, I think professionally, I have professional relationships as we all do with every single judge that we are in front of. I have professional relationships with every single attorney that is on the other side of a case and every single guardian ad litem or child representative. And whether I necessarily like or dislike or approve or disapprove, of some of Jennifer's recommendations or not, at the end of the day, um, she has been charged with doing a certain task and a judge has put his or her confidence in Jennifer, in Jennifer for that task and for that obligation and service to the court to protect the child's best interest. So I lay it out to my client as that, where I'm ultimately saying, I'm not giving us a chance to ask the court to change a child representative or change a guardian ad litem uh, because typically very highly respected attorneys in those positions. Now, that being said, if there was some type of an egregious event, egregious behavior uh, that just was, was outside the bounds, yes, then I would be obligated to one, have a conversation initially with that GAL or child rep and determine how to proceed uh, from there. But I'm happy to say 
in my 24 years as a lawyer, in my eight years of having my own law firm, I have not been in that situation uh, because I do think the lawyers that are on the GAL and child representative list are highly, highly qualified lawyers uh, and have been approved, and they're on that list for a reason. Important to note that, um, as you did, Josh, that GALs and uh, guardian at litems, uh, the same person, guardian at litems and child reps are on a list which can be looked up by the public um, in, in pretty much each county to know who is available to, to act. And as we're running short on time, I really do want to get to this um, and, and, and have both of you give me a, a minute answer. Um, what do you say to the the notion that, that many people believe that the firm that is representing, the, the firm that appears before the judge or works with a guardian at litem or child rep has, the name of the firm has an impact on who, on how the, the case is gonna uh, result. Josh, you go first. Sure, I, I would like to think, Kasim, that, that that does not have an impact on um, uh, a GAL or child representative's uh, decision. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, um, you know, and we, we haven't mentioned this, but typically a guardian ad litem or child representative's fees are being paid by each respective party, uh, not by my firm or not by the other party's firm. And I would like to think whether it's single wall law firm or some other name that maybe has more notoriety in Chicago that uh, the GAL or child representative um, is, is not going to look at that. They they are charged with protecting the best interests of the child. And I believe that the attorneys that are on the GAL list and the, the uh, child representative list are going to do just that absent and not looking at necessarily, uh, you know, who what firm am I at or what firm uh, is a Sim Cunningham at, uh, what have you. Uh, they're independent uh, thinkers uh, uh, again, appointed to protect the best interests of the children. And Jennifer, because we have, uh, we're short on time sure. uh, and, uh, in your experience, yes or no, does the name of the firm that appears on the appearance sheet have any effect on how you do your job? No, I will tell you that this, I work with attorneys who I have had a first time experience with, and it's my first case with them. And I have counsel who I've had other cases and maybe sometimes several cases with, but ultimately that the firm name has no bearing on what I'm going to say or do and why. Ultimately, I will say this, and I want to make this point. I think what gets lost in the mix sometimes is there's sometimes a conspiracy theory opinion that clients have, litigants have about, oh, you're friends with the GAL. That must mean that you're in their pocket or something like that. No, it, it means that we have colleagues, we have coworkers who we get to know just like every profession does. And actually, you want your colleagues, your coworkers to get along well. You want them to have a good relationship. It doesn't influence what my recommendations are. And I think Josh will tell you, I've been for and sometimes opposing his client's preferences on every single case we've had together. And so it varies, but it's not because we're friends outside of the practice itself or because we are colleagues who've worked together many times. It has everything to do with the merits of the case. And ultimately, you want those colleagues and counsel on all sides to get along well, because that means your case is probably going to get done a lot more effectively and efficiently, which probably costs you less when everybody's on the same team working to get it across the finish line. Hopefully we can reduce your time in court and the cost of it. So very impactful what you just said. And, and um, while I have probably have a ton more questions for the two of you, um, we are out of time. I appreciate you both, Josh and Jennifer, for, for joining us. And folks, I hope this was in helpful information as you uh, consider um, custody or divorce options in the, in the future. Thank you very much, Sam. Appreciate it. Thank you.